Welcome to Urban Policy Analysis. Uh, first class of the year. Lots of excitement going on and around the world. Uh, cities are a terrific way to understand better the world. Why? Nations are dinosaurs. Cities are fruit flies. If you want to understand the world, should you study dinosaurs or fruit flies? Fruit flies. That's why I study cities. Uh, nations are bigger, they're messier, they're, if, if from a scientific standpoint, everything is interrelated with everything else. So when you say China's doing this, France is doing that, if you want to say why, that's the hard question. And you can't tell with one case very coherently for why study cities, even if you want to study the world, markets, revolutions, feminization, etc. You need to know what goes with what and why, and that, that's why, in part, we're here. Okay. <coughs> um, the, um, how and why these things work is, of course, controversial. And the theories we deal with are, a few of them are specifically and uniquely urban. Most of them are not. Most of them are general theories that apply to nations, to markets. They work in, in economics. They work in political science. They work in sociology, geography. Most of these things overlap. In that sense, we're interdisciplinary, but we're not, um, we're not mindless. We're not uh, simple empiricists. We try to put these things together and make sense of them. <coughs> um, The main focus of the course is what, pro what processes make cities vital. But vital means very different things in different theories. And, that, and part of it is because what leads to what? What makes it more vital as well as the feeling, the, the sort of intuitive feeling of vitality? And we will elaborate, of course, as we, as we go on. And I'll, I'll mention now that we have five sections, five major sections at the beginning. And we have five kinds of answers to the to question of vitality. <coughs> um, uh, the interesting thing is that there's lots of debate. There's been a lot of debate for some time, but there's a new, there are newer debates. Um, two big things I put on the board, or two, two simple dates, are Tiananmen Square, the Paris disturbances, uh, uh, the, uh, sorry. 89 is, is, is Tiananmen Square, and the, the, the Tiananmen Berlin Wall, and Paris, Chicago, Berkeley, student and worker uprisings. This, in turn, many will link to the rise of the counterculture, to new, a new sense of how you can do things and what's right or wrong, Egalitarianism, empowerment of average citizens flows out of these. Now, th th these are dates, so these are not causes. The question of what are the bigger things which are crystallized in these events. Historians tend to like event events, but we try to place them in a context. Um, the um, I'll start with a theory that is, is more specifically urban. One of the classic urban theories from the 19th and 20th century is called central place theory. And the idea is if you have a city, the land in the center is more valuable. You may have zones. You may have uh, simply, this may be mapped with, a, with some sort of a, a distance from the, from the center where we may have price of land, and then we have distance. So as you move out, land and apartment rents get cheaper. Uh, the um, names von Thunen, Burgess, uh, many others within economics, within sociology, within geography. This is a classic 19th, 20th century theory. Brian Berry was a follower of this, 
as well as related things which really were stressed more, developed more in sociology. So sociologists added things like transportation. If you add a, add a train line or a, a, new, a new highway, how much would that change this pattern? Brian Berry came here from England. He came to the University of Chicago. He was, he was and is one of the one or two top geographers in the world. And he, and he followed this perspective for 20 years or so. I worked with him when he, when he, when he was here. But one thing which he showed uh, is, is if you take data from land parcels in Chicago, the Chicago metro area, from about 1880 to, to the late 20th century, Every decade, and you specify a model, includes especially distance, but also some of these other things. Every decade, the model gets weaker. The coefficients get weaker. The, the, the whole equation explains less. 1880, 1890, 1990. Why? Yes? It's easier to move within cities. A little bit louder? It's easier to move within cities. Why, why is it easier? Transportation is faster. There we go. Transportation and what else might you say? Anybody else want to want to add another factor? For, sh for sure, transportation is, is very, very high. Cars, trains, mass transit, these came in mostly after 1880. Uh, but what else? Yes? Population density. Yes, but is that the cause or the consequence? I mean, yes, the population density declines and the, and the land value goes down, that's true, but those are both sort of interrelated parts of the same, the same thing. So I'd say, if you think of those as, as, as a dependent variable, what are the independent variables which lead to this, to, to, uh, to less density and more spreading out? Uh, fossil communication. Fossil same. communication. Fossil communication. Faster. Faster. F faster communication. <laughs> okay, br British accent here, you caught me. Um, foster. Okay. Um, the, um, yes, no, for sure. I mean, so, I mean, so you, you probably hit the two big things that most people talk about. Transportation, communication. So communication might include over the 20th, 19th, 20th century, <coughs> what? A couple of key <coughs> obvious examples. Oh, that's sorry. Examples of Foster. Uh, from what, the 20th century? Nin uh, late 19th and 20th, yes. Oh, perhaps letters. Letters. Letters, okay. Uh, <laughs> they're still pretty slow. Well. In the US, they're really bad. <laughs> uh, what, what, what else? Um, say like tele telegrams as well. Telegrams, okay, good. So uh, mid 19th phone, century. And then moving on to the internet as well. Okay, but, but before that, telephone. Telephone, okay, that's an American invention. Maybe people don't, don't, don't talk about it. Uh, uh, telephone, then um, uh, smoke signals, okay, the old day. But uh, telephone for sure, then of course computer, internet. So in more recent years, the 20, late 20th, 21st century, the internet is very powerful in transforming lots of things and speeding them up more. So Barry ended this before the internet, uh, but probably, and there are debates uh, over, over specifically this, uh, but without, I haven't seen anybody who's updated the kind of study that, that Barry has done. But, but you're, I mean, you're, your thinking is perfect. I mean, these are, these are the kinds of things we have transportation, communication, and, so, and some other things which can come in there as well. But th these, are, these are the obvious, simple answers. What did Barry conclude from this? He said, these models are out of date. They're 19th century models, and they worked powerfully in the 19th century, but we live in the, almost the 21st century, he said in the 20th. We need something new. Specifically, they left out culture and politics. And where and why people think how they conceive of where they want to live, the aesthetics, the love, the hatred, the fear of crime, 
a variety of other things and how crime gets politicized linked with race, with ethnicity, and how those in turn, those are left out of this model. The, and so these things arguably, and this is, this is what um, one thing thing we'll explore in the course, is how much it, can we capture these systematically and compare them to transportation communication as, and as, we, as we proceed. Okay. Um, <coughs> one more gen general point leading into this, which is in, in the first reading by Judd, <coughs> is that the, these have become sort of politicized in, in debates around what's called the, uh, well, it was the Chicago School. I mean, this, was the, this, was, this was a core element of the old Chicago School model. This was called the Burgess, the Burgess Zone Theory. And, the, and in the old days in the Social Science Building, when I first came here, every room in the Social Science Building had a Burgess map, you know, hanging there. And so there was a sense this was, this is, this is life. Okay, here, here we've got, we're more global here. All right. <laughs> um, that's good. Um, the, the, uh, this was criticized by a new group called, and they call themselves Michael Deere in, in leading position. They said, we're the LA school. And on the cover of their book, they had a picture of Route 66 which is the highway that starts in downtown Chicago and goes to Los Angeles. And it said, this is urban theory. The future is the post-automobile city. It's LA, it's decentralized, it's, it's different. And the model of Chicago is the past. Okay, so the LA school blended, I, I won't go into and try, try to Take, uh, I won't try to say too much. So it, there's a mixture of Marxism, of fun, entertainment, of Hollywood. One of the one of the archetypical models for the processes are described by Michael Deere as as the game Monopoly. Monopoly is how cities work. You buy, you sell, you move, you go around the board. So is that a theory? Maybe uh, that is it's a it's a metaphor almost, and and then he mentioned uh, a movie called Chinatown. How many of you have seen the movie from the '60s called Chinatown? Okay, but it's a it's a metaphorical history of Los Angeles with lots of violence and intrigue and so forth about where did the water come from, who's stealing the water, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Um, the point is, the LA school says, we're not scientists, we don't care about science, we care about, <coughs> they don't quite say it those, that, in that way, we care about popularity, about reaching people, a bigger audience, we write for ge as generalists for, for everyone, we don't try to test our theories in any coherent way, and we don't have very specific names. For instance, the, the suburbs of LA are just called the outer area, they don't talk about Chinese versus Vietnamese versus Filipino suburbs in, in outside the, in which have very clear distinctive cultural meaning for people in Orange County and, and, and so forth, but it's not in the theory. <coughs> um, so it, Deere says his perspective is called Frankfurt Marxist Sociology. It's the, it's the Frankfurt School of Adorno and Horkheimer, which he's trying to apply to geography. and. Uh, we've had conferences together in, in California and Chicago, and, and the, the Dennis Judd the Dennis Judd, Judd paper is from a book where we had a discussion among the Chicago School, the LA School, and then of course the New York School uh, came up really last, but basically <coughs> historically last. And people said, well, if, if we've got these other two cities, what is there different? And that and point is there are differences in style among the way people think and talk about their, their cities, especially the urbanists who do this with more, with more care. The New York, the New York sky, when one core element is really Marxism, that the, a classic New York intellectual tradition, if you, if you, if you haven't seen it, take a look at, at a, there's a terrific video called Arguing the World. It's a video, it's a book, it's a website, and so forth. 
um, and it shows the sort of core elements of Marxism of how they transform new New York intellectual thinking in ways that make it different. Even if you give up dogmatic Marxism, there are elements of exploitation, hierarchy, domination, conflict uh, that that make the, 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 new, the new York perspective distinct. And elements of that are also in, in L.A. mixed with sort of a Hollywood-esque uh, uh, perspective, as, as, you, as you hear me say. What's Chicago? Chicago, in that sense, is neighborhoods, ethnicity, and the and the and the meaning of ethnicity in terms of distinct. The term is widely used in Chicago among citizens and others. Community. What community means? People talk about well, we'll go over, but but the <coughs> things like Chinatown. Wicker Park, described in the book called Neo Bohemia by Richard Lloyd, as having an anti establishment arts uh, uh, transformational uh, style which attracted people from uh, other, and so in, in contrast to say the more establishment near North Side on the lakefront. So the Gold Coast was a famous book, The Gold Coast and the Slum. Wicker Park, in a sense, adds the bohemian element. Uh, okay, so these kinds of themes are classic Chicago sociology themes. <coughs> What's new is the more explicit attention to culture and how these come together in things like scenes. So if we think of the classic definition, I'm making a more general point here, that is, if these were just three cities, nobody would care. That is, yet many of you are from internet or from other countries, these three cities, they have some degree of size and importance, but in terms of global representativeness, what we want to bring out, bring out from these are the ideas, the core propositions of what, of what makes a theory work. And I'm adding from the, from the idea of a scene a new, a new point for definition of science and, or, or theory, if we put it, scientific theory. What's a, what's a theory? What, what do you learn when you hear about a theory in a philosophy course or, or a textbook over? The philosophers of science normally say a theory is a body of propositions, of interdependent propositions, like A leads to B, B, le B leads to C, and then C, C leads to D. Uh, and then others which may, which may work like that. And then they'll say, and the assumptions under which it holds. Okay, that, that's the last part that I'm challenging of saying in an urban perspective, the beauty of cities as fruit flies is that we've got lots of them and we don't need to assume, and I'm suggesting it's better scientifically, not to assume anything, but to say maybe there's some cities that are like this, where A is strong and B is strong and C is strong, A, B, C, little A, B, C. Whereas in other cities, it may be that D is really the stronger driver. But where and why? So if we, if we think of this as the context or the more general terms, so context, and we have this, and we say this, this may be uh, US cities, these may be Chinese cities. How much do these ABCDs change when we go to China? And so a reason for cross-national research is not just to describe China, but to say how can China help us build a better theory by understanding what is specifically Asian in some way, or how much is it, is it more universal? So if they're all the same everywhere, then we can say we, we're moving toward a more, a, more general, a more general theory. Okay, so the simple point is context and comparing across context is a major way to generalize beyond one urban and to incorporate new, new processes, that is, the con I'm suggesting that a theory, a good theory includes not only propositions, but also the context within <coughs> they hold, and rather, instead of saying assumptions. So we're trying not to use the term assumptions, we're trying to say 
let's look at the, let's test the, the importance, rather than saying this holds in big cities or with perfect markets or with complete information, classic things you learn in Economics 101, how does this shift where we, where we have more information or less information or, or more competition? So rather than saying markets are efficient or less efficient, where and why are the components that make them more, that more, more efficient? Okay, yeah. Um, how, many, how, how many of you are from uh, economics? Okay, see, we got lots of economics students that this year. How many are from political science? How many from public policy? How many from sociology? Okay. How many, uh, how many from, uh, okay, I, I, I've seen the list, but just get, get, giving, giving you a flavor. We, what's great about this class is we've got, we've got diversity. And so we, we want to respond to and incorporate some of the themes that you've heard discussed in other classes. And sometimes I will say, well, as you know, from an, but I'll also say, as you know, maybe they're wrong in that class. And so we'll, we'll challenge. Uh, <coughs> but what's, what's, and so, these changes, some of the big changes that, that is, the, the, big, the one big point of this course is that we're explicitly challenging a lot of the theories in the urban area and through that, more general <coughs> theories about how, social, how society works because there are big changes going on. And our economics is perhaps the most visible, dramatic discipline that's in the process of it right now of going through huge changes. But we, so since Gary Becker came to Chicago, joined the faculty, he's had students now at Harvard like Ed Glazer. Ed Glazer's the top urban economist, and he's, he's Ed Glazer, I, other, others are now transforming some, 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 some of these issues in ways that, that the whole discipline of economics is now explicitly um, arguing about. For instance, the economists used to talk about what, 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 what's the goal of, of uh, of people maximizing their utility. Well, what's utility? It was left as a sort of abstract assumption or people would look for behavioral measures like prices. But in the last 20 years, economists have gone over, they crossed the midway, they've gone over to NORC, they're studying surveys of happiness. They, and so Ed Glazer has a paper with about 100 factors which lead to happiness, the, the economist, and he reports that most the most important variables are things like being in good personal relationships with a wife, with children, with relatives and so forth, with friends and neighbors. And these are much more important than your job, your income, or your education. Okay, that's pretty revolutionary. And to say that explicitly from an economist. Most sociologists haven't really picked that up, right? So, okay. So, so the point is, <coughs> these differences, these changes are going on and they're still controversial because many economics textbooks won't tell you what, what that paper said. Okay. Um, so if these are general, cross-disciplinary, bigger kinds of challenges, um, let me get back and give you a couple of overview points of the, of the, uh, of the, five, the five classes of um, theories. <coughs> that is, in these five, five sections of the course, we'll cover in the, in the first half, uh, up to the exam, and the, these are these are the core general ideas. After that, we will apply them, extend them, elaborate them, and the course is now going to be more lecture discussion in the first half. The second half will have more more. I want to want to try to engage you more, draw you out because we want to help apply these to things you may be thinking about in your neighborhood or your paper, or if you're doing a paper not required uh, for, for most. <coughs> um, uh, re uh, requirements are in the syllabus. All the, all the, most of the readings are on chalk. We have some books ordered at the seminary bookstore. I don't know if anybody has seen if any, any of them have come in or not. I checked today. They should be there by Friday uh, and definitely by next Monday. Okay, terrific. Um, uh, yeah, just, just on the specific, why don't we briefly introduce our two teaching assistants. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Rishi Aurora. Uh, I'm a PhD student in sociology. Uh, my major areas of focus could, are in. Could, could you both stand up? So oh, sure, sure. They'll recognize you more, sure. more easily that way. Uh, hello. Uh, my major areas of focus are economic sociology and kind of studies of technology. Uh, but I do have uh, some experience working on 
urban projects, uh, particularly around uh, municipal debt markets, uh, and so that's something I'm looking at right now. So if anybody's interested in that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I'm Timothy Elder, I'm also a PhD in sociology. Uh, my principal areas of research are in death and dying, as well as medical sociology, specifically looking at how it is that people cope with the loss of a person in their life, and specifically how it is that they use their religious community to reintegrate sort of themselves back into whatever they consider to be normal. So. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, <coughs> the, um, I will hold office hours in this room right after class, unless they, they kick us out. If they kick us out, we'll look for something nearby um, uh, each Monday. Uh, and these two guys, are, we, they may be with me for a bit on Monday, and then they both got office hours that we will post Wednesday and Tuesday, I think, which um, are not yet on the syllabus, but we will... Um, I'll revise the syllabus and, and, and put that up again shortly. Um, uh, okay. Um, let me then introduce a couple of themes in each of the five sections, um, and then and then and then have some then have some discussion. Um, <coughs> regimes and leadership is the first. Um, was the dominant view from the 30s to the 50s in, in, in this field called community power, leadership, regime. Whoever is most powerful in local domination sets policy was the idea. And the top candidate was business for many years from, from the um, um, 30s through Floyd Hunter, then Clarence Stone, continuing in, in various uh, more loose more loose writings today. Um, it was attacked by Robert Dahl as a sort of simple uh, focus of business and stressed that political leaders were more important. Uh, but in a, in a more, he began to move in this sort of contextual direction. Uh, coherence of the leadership was the key for Judd and Judd and Parkinson, um, but um, race and class politics are alternatives to business, but that still stress the sort of who's there in the city council, who's there, what's the, what's the background of the mayor, is he, uh, is he Irish or is he black, etc. cetera. Um, this is, this is a, um, this also, the, that is, that, that example depends on the social background of the individual, black, Irish, as explaining what they do <coughs> and where and how much that works is questionable in the sense that if people get more educated, they move around more, they become less attached to their families and to their ethnic group than they were in the past, then they may find a new religious community or a new quasi-religious community, which may not involve God or churches, but which may le lead to something which will transform the importance of what we can call the primordial. So if the primordial are race, class, gender, and then we can add national origins. Race, class, gender, you know, here's one, one of my favorite phrases. Race, class, gender, and national origin explain how much of what we do. Think of your courses you've had, books you've read, think of the media, think of examples that support or contradict that. Do they explain everything? Half? Zero? Okay. If you look for an answer in the social science journals and you can find someone, say I mentioned the, the paper by Ed Glazer, he has 100 variables right try to say what explains happiness or what explains shopping or what explains explains being interested in being uh, going going to sports versus um, uh, music versus uh, having a family versus something else race class gender and national origin you may be able to find all four studied at once often however you'll just hear one I mean what really counts is being black and if you're not black you can't understand the black experience you can't teach you can't read you can't understand or um, have to be a woman or uh, you have to you have to be 
poor to understand what poverty is like. Okay, so that, that sense that there's a interpenetration which is very strong is an empirical question. That is, how strong is that, in, that interpenetration of your, of your primordial background? <coughs> if you take all these four, the bottom line, the quick bottom line, and I'll to invite you to go out and look through you know, as many journal articles as you want to, to, to study this, they explain about 10%, maybe 20%. That is, 80% plus of what we do is not explained by race, class, gender, and national origin. What have we been doing in social science for a couple of hundred years? We, we're not, we're only, the, so my point is we ought to be more modest. We're only explaining about 10%. However, the media are not doing any better. Political leaders are not doing any better. People are complicated and maybe life is getting less deterministic. That is, distance was very important in the 19th century and it was a good model. But that kind of thing uh, that is, as we get more transportation, more communication, more of a sense that even though I was born a Catholic, I'm going to become an evangelical Protestant, or I'm going to become an atheist. Uh, that I was born a, a conservative Republican, but I hate conservative Republicans. I'm, I'm becoming a revolutionary. Those can change, and insofar as these are more choice-driven, maybe by luck, by chance, by who you happen to have as a roommate assigned by your, your dorm, whatever. Uh, these things explain a lot. And our theories don't usually, and so they're often called noise or unexplained variants or something like that, or um, uh, lack of information, but if we recognize that a lot of a lot of life is more complicated, but but the proportion, the proportions change, and where and why they change in terms of this kind of modeling, is one thing which we, which we want to focus on. Okay. They also, in a corollary, of this is instead of looking for <coughs> one theory, that is, you can look for <coughs> a, a leads to b and we just say, you know, it's little a explains, explains everything. Whether this is class, race, gender, income, whatever else. Um, instead, this idea that no, that even these four only explain a fair amount can lead us to say, you know, maybe we need multi-causal theories. That is, let's start with these four and maybe add some other things, including some characteristics up here. So I, I put in the name of China, but if we're being more scientific, we could try to say, we don't want to have one country. We want to talk about, say, the population size of China or the income of China. That is, analytical variables that can be generalized to other, to other places and, and, and times. But what this lack of determinism of, that is, in the 19th century, they were called, or the, the, the 19th century theories have been relabeled Simple and sovereign. This is a simple, a simple and sovereign theory. A causes B. Race causes everything, or class causes everything. Uh, <coughs> as we move toward multi-causality, then life gets more complicated and more multi-causal. But if we recognize the importance of trying to be multi-causal, we, we, we don't need to be frustrated or disappointed if only small things, only smaller things matter. Okay. And the same story can and should and does emerge if we have a sensitive ethnography, a comparison of, uh, you know, if I, I try, try to ignore that. Um, see if I can, no, 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 no I, I, I don't, I, well, I, 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 I turn the ring off. Uh, okay, no, how, how do you turn this? Oh, hit the button on the side, the right side. It's, it's all okay. Uh, okay. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I learn every day. Okay, that's great. Uh, just so we're, we're still recording, so I'm doing this as a backup audio. Okay. Um, <laughs> theory two is if leadership doesn't explain everything, what else do we want to add? Section two is markets. Competition, markets, buying and selling, 
people moving, and so the decision of where to live in a sense of competing for location for markets. Markets are, have been introduced in the, in the urban area, especially after 1989. The big version, I mean, the earlier version was Paul Peterson, uh, uh, who, who, who argued that even if you're the new mayor of Chicago, Harold Washington, as he, as he said, first African-American mayor of Chicago, lots of racism, so forth, he would like to have policies that would help African Americans. On the other hand, he also said, the, pre the president is Ronald Reagan. He won't give me money the way we the this, this city got in the past. I cannot implement the policies that I'd like to. And therefore, even though I have a black face and I have a constituency, I will not try to simply follow my preferences in terms of fiscal and ethnic concerns. And I'm, I'm simplifying, I, should, I shouldn't just say Harold Washington, because he said from the, from, from the beginning, he was not racist. He said, I will be more concerned with reform. We'll discuss what re the different meanings of reform, but he campaigned in the middle of his campaign, that is before, before he ran for, he ran for mayor three times, he lost twice, he got no votes, the third time he won. Uh, <coughs> When he won, he, he, he won on a, on a basis of, of reform, and he, and he followed it to a sub substantial degree, which, which basically he said implied he would not simply give grants, contracts, and support African Americans. He would support people who, neighborhoods, neighborhood projects, neighborhood activities that, that were more deserving when there was competition for federal funds or other kinds of things like that. Okay, so in that sense, this kind of, of um, so Peterson labeled this in terms of what do you do if you're if you would like to so-called be an economist of redistribute redistribute we'd like to give away we'd like to take away all the money from the one percent and spread it out to everybody else if you try to do that in one city by saying have a by having a tax on on uh, everything or say Tony Preckwinkle said why don't we have a you know, a little tax on cola drinks. She may not be mayor today because that was so unpopular. Talk about cola drinks. Talk, or say instead taxing the one percent. That is, the, the, the. Um, <coughs> um, the the degree of competition between cities is a huge constraint on what you can do as a policymaker. That's a market. It's a market of competition and it's driven by the fear or the knowledge or the actual migration of residents, investors, and others who <coughs> change the land price and who change the, the voting base, but who, but who constrain leaders who might do something different, but who, who will act in response to competition. Does this explain everything? No, it's one factor along with the others. And so if you're a leader or if you're one of you are consultants or advisors to mayors, to council members and others, thinking of where and how much this matters and how much, how much weight it should be given versus equity, equality, democracy, democratic participation, trading these off is become subtle, but we're, we're, laying, out, we're laying out some elements of this. Okay. Um, Saskia Sassen, after 1989, globalization is the new, the, new, the new label for a lot of this. That is, it's not just national competition, it's global competition. And so, so New York is competing with London, is competing with Tokyo for banks, investment, et, et cetera. And so Brexit, I mean, this is most, 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 most debates over Brexit. How much will London collapse or go down? as a consequence of uh, leaving the European Union and being less of a financial uh, and freer market kind of location. This is, this, these are visibly in the, in the, in the press now. Um, and of course, Trump. I mean, Trump's tariff negotiations with China, with, with the world, in a sense, he's trying to say, I wanna be a strong, visible leader. I'll do this stuff and negotiate it we're not just going to have smooth markets. 
Okay, and so we, we get the interpenetration of the, the ideology, the, the personality, the rhetoric, uh, et cetera, in ways that these are not just theories, these are ideologically informed uh, perspectives as well. Okay, um, so quick point on that. I will not present one, one normative, that is the, the, we can talk about positive theories and normative theories. What we, in a sense, we will, we will introduce these five perspectives. They have mostly positive elements. They usually also have a normative element, such as I'm illustrating here with, with Trump. <laughs> but we can either, we, that is, how can we treat that? I'm suggesting we can talk about ideology, we can compare an action or a program to an underlying set of values, and then we can say, how widely share these values as scientists? So we'll try mostly to be positive in this course, but we'll talk about some normative issues, mostly from a, as we, as we'll try to be generally pretty scientific. Uh, we will not, we're not, I'm not advancing a perspective that say markets are good and uh, something else is bad. Um, it's, it's, um, it's one of trying to stress the more positive side, but not ignoring the interpenetration and the power of ideology or religion or other, or other strong drivers of preferences and activities. Okay, the third section of the course moves more directly to this. It's called political culture. Uh, Daniel Elazar has, has a discussion of, of U.S. political culture. Uh, that's the U.S. if you can't recognize my drawing. Uh, and then there are three migration streams from, from different parts of, of Europe, basically, or sorry, I, let's say, I shouldn't say different parts of Europe. These are all English, they're mostly Southern English, but they have three ideologically competing perspectives. These are the New England moralists who then migrated out to uh, Microsoft and Seattle and so forth. These are the, these are the, <coughs> and, and so the uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, in their sort of Western Michigan has Dutch reform moralism, which is very different from what we have elsewhere. Um, in the state of Illinois, we have all, well, further south, we have, we have all three of these. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention in passing. So Elazar, on the reading list, <laughs> uh, articulated these most coherently. This, the, the second is Middle Atlantic or Market, market is a is a, a, a good one summary term that he that he uses. Think of the Wall Street perspective. What you can say on Wall Street about Wall Street, or a um, um, what's good for marketing, uh, is a bit of a simplification, but it's very different from the moralism of the Bostonian, or let's say better Salem, Massachusetts perspective, the Scarlet Letter. The third is the southern hierarchical, paternalistic. Uh, the South was built initially historically on slavery, and the sense that people could work as in, they were initially called indentured servants, and they were white. They were English whites, uh, <coughs> and and the sense of and and they were assembled. A plantation group was assembled, or plantation groups were assembled. So you'd have a blacksmith, you'd have a cook, you'd have someone who knew how to chop down trees, people who could, who could plant and, and pick cotton. These people were assembled in England and then shipped to the North Carolina colonies, the uh, Virginia colonies, and they would then build plantations from those people in a hierarchical manner. Uh, okay. So that, and then of course the Civil War led to, was the biggest conflagration among these. But the point is, these still are there. How many of you lived in the South for more than five years? Okay, t t take a look around the room. Just hold, hold your hands up. That is, the point is, most of you don't know anything about the South. And I bet many of you come from parents who uh, were, yeah, how many of you have our second or third generation Southerners? Uh, okay, all right, now, so that, 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 that's good. So that's, this is a higher, this is a higher than usual representation of the South. Um, okay, but the point is the South links us 
to much of the rest of the world more than do these other two. In part because we don't have a, we don't have a strong aristocracy. And so much of English, French, German, Italian history is fighting the aristocracy and, and so forth. We don't have that. So these things become more visible. And well, I'll, I'm going to call on you as, as the course proceeds because these things are still, are still here. But they also change. People change every day. They go to college in a different place. They get a job. They move around. They go for effect. But, they, but how much and where each of those factors lead them to be present and persistent is, is one thing we will look at for evidence and for. Uh, and let, let me add one more point. <laughs> Moralism has grown more important not just in New England, but I had, I had some students from India and Bangladesh, and I said, why don't you look at, look at a big survey called the World Values Survey. How important is moralism in, in uh, that is, well, why do I mention this? Max Weber wrote a book about the religion of India and the religion of China, and he talked about moralism is, is the source of why India did not industrialize. That is, why, why was industrialization first in England? Why didn't it happen in China? They had 5,000 years of civilization. The Chinese developed science. They developed gunpowder. They developed all kinds of things. Why didn't they do this? Why didn't India? Okay, for China, the answer is more complicated. But for India, the pretty simple answer is because the Indians lost, the, the elite lost a war and they became gurus. They, they became uh, uh, otherworldly people in the jungles who retreated from the physical surroundings and moralism of sense of doing the right thing, thinking through the moral aspects of this is more important than making money or succeeding socially. So when A.K. Sen got his Nobel Prize uh, a couple of years ago, <coughs> top Indian economist, he said in his speech, what's the most important development of the entire 20th century? What do you think he said? If he were Chinese or American, what would he, prob what would he probably have said? The internet. The internet? Uh, what, what, before the internet, uh, what, what else? What led to the internet? Maybe higher income, wealth, spreading of, spreading of the, that is, the, the simple economic answer is more money for everybody. He did not say that. <coughs> He said democracy. Democracy, in that sense, would probably not have been mentioned as the first thing, the most important change in the 20th century by an American or Chinese economist. But A.K. Sen, in that example, illustrates the moralistic concern of the Indians, which are not just from New England. That is, moral concerns, and so these are two big historic examples but more recently, how about China? China today, that is, China has a, has a traditionally has, has complicated, I mean, we've got the, the Mao, the, the post-World War II uh, communist revolution, but earlier we had clientelism, earlier we had a strong state. These were elements which were not moralistic in the way that the Indians and the New Englanders talk. However, in the last 10 or 20 years, China has become one of the biggest concerns in China is the same concern in much of the rest of the world. Corruption is what it's called. And how do we deal with corruption? Uh, that is, and why, and, why, and why is this important? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it as, as we proceed, but my point is corruption is a term that comes from the moralistic side. That is, it's saying, it's wrong, it's sinful, it's bad to do that. That's not, you'll get more money if you do it, you get a better job or, or whatever else, or it'll make you more powerful. That is, the moral side is, a, is, a, is something which we want to include, and where and how is, is more complicated, more subtle, but we'll, we'll bring it in in various ways. Okay, theory four is the um, innovation. Joseph Schumpeter, a uh, brilliant economist, did a famous book, that says, uh, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. His big argument there and elsewhere was the driver of the economy 
is, yes, competition is there, yes, markets are there, yes, investment is there, let me, so Al Alfred Marshall talked land, labor, capital, and management, the, the drivers of the economy. Schumpeter said, yes, but management, what about management? And so the big idea of Schumpeter is ideas, innovation, new things which the, which the, which the entrepreneur may be able to, to try to develop and or respond to markets and citizens and consumers who will buy the product. So if you have a brilliant innovation, you think it's brilliant, but nobody buys it, it has no impact on the economy. So in that sense, the, 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 so the internet, uh, battery-driven cars, flying to Mars as a product that you, or as a service, service product, whatever you can, you can, you can buy, the, these wild new innovate, innovations, Fla Richard Florida suggests synthesizing, he doesn't have that much that's new, but he synthesizes and he, he gets credit for the rise of the creative class. The publisher <coughs> added the word class, the book doesn't really talk about class much at all, it's, it's, it's innovation and creativity. <coughs> But the point is he synthesizes literature from psychology, from, from child rearing, from management, from office, from office, organ, office studies, from, um, from many different subfields and shows basically they all have been stressing the importance of innovation. Um, and that's increasingly recognized, so this has become a, a major, a major um, uh, concern through um, Schumpeter through Jane Jacobs, urban urban uh, planner, activist, um, writing about economics, although she didn't have training as an economist, she wrote a lot of economic work. Ed Glazer, who, who then in turn cite these as major sources of their, of their building. Um, um, okay, I'll leave it for there for now. The fifth is the most new and different. Uh, this is the idea that the arts, leisure, culture, and aesthetic aspects of consumption are new critical drivers of cities, the economy, how we live and think in ways that have been minimally studied by most socialists, especially social scientists. Art historians may talk about the history of one art, one artwork, but they, they don't tend to talk about the impact of, of Van Gogh on, on, uh, on the economy. Whereas people are now talking about this, how much, and, and the, the artists themselves, that as many artists are now talking about public art, they're going into streets, so we have graffiti, we have murals, I mean, the, the, the Romans had, had murals, so we have bits of this, but how much is this transforming more one, one of the, the, the earliest statements was from Balzac, <coughs> that is a, a hugely successful economically novelist based on a mass sale of his books, said, we need to be creative and we artists need to live in separate neighborhoods. So he lived in a different neighborhood of Paris. We need to have, we, need, we don't want this bourgeois lifestyle to constrain us. We want to live freely and do what we want. Therefore, we can create, create better. Okay, continue with Baudelaire poet at the end of the 19th century, continues on with Jane Jacobs and, 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 with, and with, um, um, with other people who have, who have talked, uh, Walter Benjamin, we'll, we'll talk about. That is, if these are backgrounds historically, this is now exploding. So the, the, um, the uh, Afri I live in Bronzeville, African-American, I mean, Har Harlem and Bronzeville, the two leading cultural uh, uh, locations in, in, in the U.S. for, for African-American culture. Young men there, they want to, they either play basketball or write rap songs. Uh, Englewood, the lowest income, most dangerous neighborhood in Chicago, a guy, a sociology student is doing a PhD, is using his, making videos, had some fancy equipment. Guys, every black teenager, 17 to 22, he'd run into, say, hey, can you make a video of me with my rap song because you've got better equipment than I do? That is, this is hot stuff. Uh, Forrest Stewart, uh, been here, worked on, worked on this stuff for about five years. One of his big findings is 
the black gangs are no longer stressing violence, drugs, money, and turf. They're stressing videos about this. They pose with a big gun. They say, ah, 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 and then they'll, oh, well, they'll sing about it. And their rating on YouTube is what they want. That's a revolution. Nobody, media hasn't picked up, but well, it's, the book is not out. He's got a couple of papers that show this. This is wild stuff. Uh, <coughs> um, okay. Um, the arts are thus important, not just for yuppies. They're being used in neighborhoods all over the US <coughs> and more in Europe than here, more in it that is more traditionally and officially uh, uh, from the Renaissance onward and even before. Uh, <coughs> we'll, we'll talk a bit of that about this, but, but the point is where and how this set of, so the Robert Fogel, Nobel Prize economist here, did, uh, did his, his, Nobel, the, his famous book was called Time on the Cross. Was slavery economically productive or not? That is, if you were a slave owner, could you make more money by having slaves or by paying a wage and having people work with you through market prices? And answer, his, his answer was slavery wasn't really very economically helpful. So saying that led him to be labeled racist, irresponsible, and so forth. Uh, and so he, 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 he carried that on. But then, then he did. He had an African-American wife. Uh, he knew she went. He was Jewish, middle class, secular, never really went to, went to temple. Uh, his wife went to church every week. He never paid much attention. Yeah, I, heard, I heard him give a, a, a workshop on this uh, here. <coughs> he never paid much attention until, until later, later in life. And then he began to realize what she was doing was really influencing her life and his life. So he wrote a book called The, the Fourth Great Awakening. And basically, it, he, he maps the rise of leisure time rising from the 19th century onward and how the ex explode, expansion of leisure time led to more sensitivity to new activities as an economic background leading into things like arts, culture, caring for others, volunteering activities, a whole range of things which, which transformed how, how, how we live. So I'm making, I'm, I'm giving you an example of, of an econ, of a, of a neoclassical Chicago economist who made this argument uh, that, the, that the arts and more have, have been emerging, leading into uh, lots more of the that we'll talk about. Um, okay, taken together, the old themes of capitalism, class conflict, race, class, gender, bi business dominance, and the like are still there. We shouldn't ignore them, but they've been challenged, and as I said, if they only explain 10%, We've got other things that are coming in to help explain more. Um, and um, we'll use Chicago a number of times. We'll contrast, <coughs> that is, you can find all of these in different Chicago neighborhoods. So in that sense, the context, we can go to China, but we can also just go to different neighborhoods. We got, we got 50 wards, that is more than most cities in the world. Chicago has recognized and prized these ethnic differences and created a formal structure of the city council and the wards to permit the preservation. So we have ethnic parades, ethnic, we have more, we have something like four times as many neighborhood festivals as New York and any other city in the US. That the, these traditional ethnic patterns are prized celebrated in parades, and they were, of course, the core of politics and policy for for, for, for <coughs> many years. This changes, but we have the new gay neighborhoods or young professional neighborhoods up around the, 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 Cup, the Cup Stadium or Boys Town, so-called. But the, the initially, these, these new, these new lifestyle-defined neighborhoods were treated by the Chicago City Hall daily, too, as eth new ethnic groups. 
So when they said, when they said, okay, then bringing the arts to Chicago, so let's put up some statues, let's put up something which celebrate individual neighborhoods. So in Chinatown, we have an elegant Chinese statue. In Greek town, there's a, there's a something which goes back to Greek to Greek history and the like. When they went to Boys Town, they said, okay, we're going to put up some rainbow or some celebrations of uh, uh, LG. Uh, it, it, Earlier it was called homose homo 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 heterosexual, LGBTQ, etc. <coughs> We're going to put up a celebration of this in a in a statue. People say, "Hey, wait! My uh, grandmother wouldn't like it if she came to visit me and saw that I'm, you know, I'm living right next to one of these things." Uh, and what did the city hall say? This is a gay neighborhood. We're putting up gay art, and so people who wanted to be more discreet move north, move to other places. But the point is that the tradition of Chicago politics, even with Mayor Daley too, who, who, be, who, who began, he, he marched in the gay rights parade in his first year, first year in office, celebrating a change of perspective. Nevertheless, he still treated being a gay as another ethnic group, which shows how much that template still still was uh, actively used and where okay so so the the um, uh, the alternative <coughs> is to say the rules have changed but the question is how much is that true empirically and, and the answer my, the answer I'm suggesting is it depends that we can find elements more like this uh, that is we can find we can find we, we can travel internationally we can go around the world and or we can go to different neighborhoods and we'll start uh, we'll start on, yeah, that, yeah I, I didn't mention, uh, let me just say this then, then uh, question. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll, uh, we're going yeah, to have more general discussion uh, almost right now. We'll have a bike ride to Chicago neighborhoods this Saturday, starting at 10 a.m. 10, 10 near Reagan, uh, getting assembled, et cetera, 10 a.m. near Regenstein Library. There's a posting on, I sent out, I sent out an email to those of you that were registered <coughs> maybe three or four days ago. I don't have, it, I mean, if, if anybody has, if anybody has that handy up, I'll, I'll, we can put it up on the board for, because some, some of you uh, may not have seen it, but basically, Dean John Boyer and Mark Hansen and I will each ride and then we'll stop. We'll mostly be talking about sites. I used to call it Icons of Black Power. Uh, it's now called South Side his history of Chicago is a little more bland and label, but but basically we especially feature the African American tradition, but we also go into Bridgeport, the Irish, um, UIC, the uh, uh, okay, uh, and and back. Uh, if you don't want to spend spend the uh, you know four four or five hours, you can you can drop out at at, 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 any, at any point and, and come and come home. Okay. Um, no, no divvies allowed. Unfortunately, you can rent. You can rent a bike. There are lots of places that right, right, right near here. Just Blackstone Bike Works is just south of the, the Midway and um, and others. Uh, or good to own a bike. Um, yeah. How many of you have lived in Chicago for more than more than uh, two or three years? Okay. See, now that's it. The more of you are from the south than are from Chicago. That's a revolution. Okay, but but the low but the low proportion from Chicago is normal. That is, most of you are not from Chicago. Therefore, we got some wild and woolly and fantastic uh, things going on here. That's why I came to, the, to Chicago and the University of Chicago because this was and oh, I, I should say is the leading urban center for urban studies in the world. And, we, and we've got the legacy, the tradition, the books, the papers, the data, and, and why. Max Faber came here and he said, studying Chicago is like studying a man with his skin cut off. You can see everything moving around in ways that you don't if you're in Paris or, or Beijing. Uh, they, they've got too much, too much covered. Okay, um, so the shock, the, the openness, the, the expl and the politicization, the open, active discussion of these kinds of things which are politically incorrect in m much of the U.S. Is, is a, says it's a great place to be. Okay, first question over here. Let's, let's have discussion for now. We've got uh, t 10 minutes or so. Yes, ma'am.
excellent point. I mean, this, most of you, that is, the sense of the Catholic Church, the Democratic Party, these were the classic hierarchical, dominating institutions of Chicago. So we, we're moving away from that, but they still are stronger in Chicago than most of the U.S. And so that, that excellent points. Thank you. Yeah. Do we know if there was ever any like formal explanation as to why they did that? Because I understand that it can seen as like a political way to say we are for these ethnic areas, but it also seems like a way to identify spaces as this is where you belong and don't come over here because you don't belong over here. So like, was there ever any opposition to the creation of these like markers to tell people where they're supposed to be? I'm sure there was a little bit in other in other areas, but most of it, the most visible one was was in Boys Town with with, 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 with the gays. I would say, but the, I think the simple answer though is no. That is the majority answer was most Chicagoans, most public discussion for the 20th century is talked about separate quote communities, and community is often used to to, to mean Polish, Jewish, Irish, Italian. African American and, and and so forth, um, uh, but we'll we'll talk about that general theme continually as we through 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 the course. So thank you both for raising it. Uh, but I guess that the follow up is this is one factor along with many others, and so where and how these are interrelated with each other, and what leads to either tolerance or appreciation or a seeking out of what one could call cosmopolitanism by living in a neighborhood with more diverse ethnic uh, neighbors is something which is changing but is opposed or supported in, in various so, so things. So, so all these things are possible, but, but I, I'd say the more dominant Chicago answer is hierarchy and fighting racism, et cetera. But you're from Detroit, so you know this you, you know this stuff well. All right. Uh, questions, comments? What's your reaction to what you heard? Heard this all before or some, some new things? Some new things. What, what's the most new that you heard? <coughs> Didn't know about the the, the boy the boys town. Okay, okay. Um, who else? Reactions? Yes. Where where, where where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Alabama. There we go. Uh, you, you, did you live your whole life there before you came here? You, were your parents from Alabama? Uh, my father. Father. What, what part of Alabama? Uh, South Alabama. South. Okay. Yeah, well, we didn't we didn't talk about the South per se, but anything that struck you that I'm sure you you're thinking about how is Alabama different from from Chicago in the North? Any any thoughts of how any of this fits in in how you think about the Southern and the non-Southern aspects? of Just a little louder. Population is more dense in, in the north. Okay. What else? The woman in front of you was pointing out how the Chicago tradition is not liberal in the general American sense. It's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of visible, open, in that sense, ethnic, closed, uh, and uh, political conflict, open political. I mean, people killed, or killed each other in Al Capone City in the early 20th century, a lot over ethnic issues. But, 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 um, example of being uh, from Alabama, say, to today. Say, uh, of, of, say, of, of liberalism or non-liberalism. Non 
there's something growing up in life. I want to say in your high school. How did this come out in your high school? That you saw it? was not taught in a public public high school. All right. Interesting. Okay, so I mean that that's that's enough to think about for, for, for a bit. Uh, other points. Who's someone from outside the US who wanna give us a someone give us some non US so. Where, where's our, 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 our British Chicago is, is probably the most politicized, crystallized along ethnic lines of, of, any, Ameri of, any, of any major American city. Uh, Albany was sort of number two, and, and they both had strong Irish Catholic <coughs> leadership that pulled, pulled these things together. But they reinforced, that is, most, most other cities in the US reinforced by the national government, by discrimination and other things, whatever, basically said, you must have, um, uh, you cannot just have at large elections. So at, at, in, in Texas, several cities had at large elections and there were no African Americans in the entire city council. And so the, the uh, Department of Justice said this is discrimination. You've got to somehow permit African Americans to be elected in Dallas and Houston uh, uh, and, and, and the like. And so they created legally separate wards moving in the Chicago direction. But the point is, these are the, 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 the law of how big is a ward and how does it work is embedded in this kind of cultural and ide ideological context in ways that, that, um, that, have, that, have, that have made these visible and active uh, issues. But the, the, the simple point is, most cities have followed that national, that is they've tried to, from the 19th century onward, they tried to play down or destroy ethnic politics. Chicago was the opposite, celebrating ethnic politics. Chicago's tradition is thus Irish Catholic. Strong political leadership is, uh, even though they're only 8% whatever of, 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 the, of the population, they are the political, the traditional political leader of Chicago. Okay, we're at the end. We'll have uh, questions, office hours, or anybody who wants to, to chat further. We will see you next Monday. Thank you.